Well, hello, everyone. Welcome again to Vineyard Church North Phoenix. Whether you're here in the room or joining us online, we really are so glad that you chose to spend part of your holiday weekend here with us at the Vineyard. I mean, those of you here in person or in town, like, I mean, the weather this morning, right? I mean, it's not going to last, but let's enjoy it while we can. Online, if you're joining us from somewhere else, I hope it's as nice as it is right here, but I also hope it stays that way longer than it will today, probably. I mean, let's face it, we know it's going to get warmer. If you happen to be a guest here with us today, whether in person or online, first of all, thanks for spending part of your holiday weekend with us. My name's Keith. I'm one of the pastors here, and we really are honored that you chose to be here today. We hope that you enjoy the service, but our highest hope is always that by our gathering together, you would experience God's presence. We gather together on the weekends as a church family to worship together. It's one of the things that we do as we follow Jesus together. We worship together by singing songs like we did earlier. We sing songs about God. We sing songs to God, reflecting on the things that he's up to in our lives and through our church family. We worship God together by studying together from God's Word, from the Bible. And we're going to do that in a little bit. And one of the other reasons that we get together on weekends to worship God together is to give back to God from our finances. Because we believe that God ultimately is the source of everything that we have. And we choose to honor him, to worship him by giving back to him from our finances. So to those of you who already give faithfully and generously to God through Vineyard Church North Phoenix, I just want to say thank you. Uh, We get to be the church that we are because you give. And I pray that God blesses you as you continue to give. And for maybe those of you who haven't yet kind of taken the little, the, 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 the plunge of giving back to God, I challenge you to do that. Just try giving a little bit back to him and see what happens. It's one of the ways that we partner with God to transform lives in our community and all around the world. So let's pause together. We're going to pray for our giving. Whenever we do that, we're going to pray and ask that God would speak to us through today's teaching. But also, I do want to acknowledge, you know, this is Memorial Day weekend, and we want to acknowledge the men and women who have paid the ultimate price, who have given their lives so that we can enjoy the freedoms we enjoy, like being able to gather together like this to worship our God together. And of course, we are in the wake right now of a national tragedy, and we want to pause and remember those who lost their lives this week and Um, and their families and and the hurt and grief that they're going through. So let's pause together and, and pray for those things, okay? God, we love you. God, we thank you for all that you are up to through this church. God, thank you that we get to partner with you to make a difference in the lives of so many families and individuals in our community and even all around the world. God, I pray that that whenever we give, God, that you would continue to use what we give to transform lives. And God, we thank you for the sacrifice of those who came before us, those who who gave their lives so that we can enjoy the freedoms we do today, that we can gather together in this space, not in secret, worship together. And God, for, for those lives who were so tragically impacted and devastated in this past week, God, we pray for your presence. We pray for you to be there in the midst And we pray for your comfort over those who are are missing loved ones. And God, we want to hear from you today. We want to hear from you. Will you speak to us as we study together from the Bible? God, will you anoint me with the gift of teaching and, and let each of us hear from you today what you want us to hear? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been doing a series on hope called Hope Has a Name over the last several weeks, and we're going to finish that up this weekend as we talk about how do we deal with suffering. But before we get into the suffering part, I want to begin by talking about hope. The Bible actually has a lot to say about hope. For example, in the book of Romans, we were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. 
But if we look forward for something, to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. See, hope by definition requires uncertainty. I mean, if I already have something, well, then I don't need to hope for it, right? And one of the main researchers, main modern researchers on the subject of hope says it this way. Hope is like standing at point A, and we're always moving into the future toward point B. We have hopes or goals or dreams for the future. Some of our hopes are big ones. Like, I, I hope I, get a, a, I have a great friendship with this person, or I hope I get a great job, or I hope to change the world, etc. And we also have little hopes. You know, things like, I hope I get a new bike for Christmas. I hope this movie's good. You know, when we use the word hope this way, we're actually indicating that there's a good possibility, or, or at least that we believe there is a good possibility that the thing that we are hoping or really wishing for won't actually happen. Especially when we're going through the drive through right? I hope they get my order right. And then in life, challenges, hardships come, minor irritations, minor disruptions, and they try to snuff out my hope. Sometimes major disruptions come, things like a recession or an illness or loss. People who are good at holding on to hope, world-class hopers, they have an ability to persist and to keep faith and to find a way to move forward into the future. That's what the power of hope can do. To be a world-class hoper means that I have worthwhile and, and even noble goals, and I don't give up on them easily. And it means that I bring a sense of, of expectancy, of eagerness into every single day. You know, when I have hope, I can actually bring a sense of life into others. Hope, it can improve our work, our relationships, and hope can even improve our souls. Now, for a lot of people, it's really easy to confuse optimism or positive thinking with hope. Optimism, which is a good quality, is a predisposition to expect things to turn out well. Optimism is a personality trait. And being optimistic, having an optimistic predisposition, that, that's great. But it's usually focused on circumstances. Hope, however, hope is a Christian virtue. Now, hope encompasses optimism, but it's rooted in something much, much deeper. During the Cold War, in former Czechoslovakia, Vaclav Havel split his time between being a political prisoner and doing state-imposed menial work. But he was also the poet of hope for the Czech people. In fact, he was so much so that when the wall finally came down and Czechia, or the Czech Republic, was set free, he became its first president. He was asked what kept him going through all those dark years, and he wrote these words. He said, Hope, in this deep and powerful sense, is not the same as joy that things are going well, or willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously headed for early success, but rather an ability to work for something because it is good, not just because it stands a chance to succeed. The more unpromising the situation in which we demonstrate hope, the deeper that hope is. Hope is not the same thing as optimism. It's not the conviction that something will turn out well. Hope is the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. I think the deepest and the most important form of hope, the, the only one that can really keep us going in difficult times is the kind of hope that we get from somewhere else. So today, I want to talk about that somewhere else. We're optimistic about how things might turn out, but, but the psalmist says this to his soul when it's crushed. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? 
I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. The psalmist would never say something like, I will put my optimism in God. No, because optimism is based on circumstances. But hope transcends circumstances. Hope is something that we get from somewhere else. Look what the Apostle Paul says in his letter to the church in Rome. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice that Paul doesn't say, I pray that God, the source of optimism, will fill you so you overflow with confident optimism. That's because hope transcends circumstances. Now, when Paul wrote these words in Romans 15, most people in the ancient world didn't think very highly of hope. You know, these days, hope has become such a positive word that it's hard for us to imagine that anybody not thinking of hope in a positive way. But most of the ancient world did not think of hope in a positive way. So I want us to look at hope and why the ancient world tended to dislike it. That way, we'll be better able to understand these words that Paul wrote to the church in Rome and why these words brought hope to the world. And how that can bring hope to you today. So listen, to really understand this, we're all going to have to really dial in and bring our A game, okay? So everybody, look at your neighbor, say, bring your A game. Look at your neighbor, say, bring your A game online. Type it in the chat. Bring your A game. Okay. Oh, guys, I feel like we're ready. I have a lot of hope for this. Okay. Here we go. The big issue in the ancient world as it is today, one of the biggest, best questions is, how do we deal with suffering? What do we do when we're standing at point A, but failure or poverty or a virus or a recession or a death rob us of the future that we want? The ancient writers generally said that what you have to do is to count on yourself. They said, don't count on the world or the gods or someone else. You have to count on yourself, your own capacity for reason. They said that things like like desire or wanting or hoping that, that it just sets you up for misery. So what you need to do is just... Lower your standards. Don't hope for bigger things. That's why in ancient Rome, a common practice people were taught was to write out a hardship list. People would write out a list of sufferings that you might go through that that could then train you to stop hoping for something because of those possible hardships. And it would just allow you to, to, to own your own sense of reason to prevail. In the ancient world, like ours today, suffering was easier if it could be shared with someone else. Suffering is eased when it's shared. Suffering is easier when someone close, someone trusted, knows about it and shares in it with you. In fact, one of the noblest themes in Paul's day was a friend who was willing to suffer and to sacrifice and maybe even to die for their friend. The Roman writer Cicero, he noted that sometimes people would go to a theater and they would, they would see a scene where somebody would die for a friend and they would just weep. They would rise to their feet and give a standing ovation at the sight of one person sacrificing their own life for another. Paul would have been thinking about this when he introduces this new definition of hope to the ancient world. In fact, one of the things that the ancient writers taught was that if a person were to die for someone else, the person you die for has to be a person of great value. The person you might be willing to die for, they must be worthy of your death. To die for an unworthy person, that would be a foolish thing to do. And their attitude about suffering in the ancient world is that even if you do help somebody who is suffering— 
You don't join them in their suffering. You, you don't share their suffering. You're not allowed to do any suffering of your own because that would disturb your tranquility. They believed that you had to distance yourself emotionally from another person. If that other person's condition or suffering begins to cause you any sort of internal suffering. The ancients had a word for that kind of suffering. They called it groaning. And they really looked down on groaning. They believed that groaning was for the weak. Only weak people groaned. Groaning was for losers. Now, we, we all know about groaning, right? Any Arizona sports fans in the room? <laughs> uh, Cardinals! Suns! I think there's a baseball team, too. I'm not sure, though. I don't know. You know, when you asked that girl or that guy out and you got rejected, ah, you groan. You don't get that promotion or that raise at work. Ah, you groan. You had your hopes up for something, but it didn't happen. And you groan. In the ancient world, they were anti groaning. Epictetus wrote, no good man ever groans. Plutarch said, groaning is a sign of weakness. Cicero taught, groaning must be resisted, and it is a disgrace to groan. They taught that if you could master your spirit, and if you could become so self-reliant that no circumstance would disturb you, then you would have won the ultimate honor. Then you would have conquered. Being a conqueror meant that you had become so self-sufficient, so self-reliant that nothing could disturb you. And this sets up what Paul is going to say. The Greek word for conquering is nikeo. The same word, nikeo, might also be translated as overcome or victory. That's where the word Nike comes from. The Nike company, victory, Overcoming, conquering. The wise sages in the ancient world said that lesser men might prize conquering a city or an army or or some other competitor, but they said that the truly wise people in the ancient world, they knew better than that. They said that real victory, real conquering, real nikeo means conquering internal opponents. It means conquering my fear. It means conquering my worry. It means conquering death itself. They weren't looking to conquer except for their own internal struggles. And that's why hope wasn't a prized commodity in those days. In fact, hope would have been considered to be like like a moral disease. Hope was like a sign of weakness. It meant that you were depending on power outside of yourself. If you were a person of any standards, then suffering was something you you didn't want to have to have anything to do with. And it's into this environment that the Apostle Paul writes this. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. And the natural response, the trained social response, when people would read the word hope, they would say, no, no, hope will disappoint you. Hope will let you down. But Paul says, this hope, this Jesus Hope doesn't disappoint. Why? Because we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. The reason the ancients didn't believe in hope for human beings is because they didn't believe in hope for the universe. 
They believed history was just an endless cycle of ups and downs. They didn't believe that history was leading anywhere. But Paul disagrees. See, Paul brings first from ancient Israel and continued and affirmed by the life of Jesus the teaching that the universe had a great beginning. Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God created. And that creation is heading someplace. It has a point A and it has a point B. The prophets called point B the place where where creation is headed. Shalom, or the kingdom of God of God. They believed that everything won't always be this way. Everything will not remain all messed up like it is now. I mean, everything is really messed up right now, right? Because of Jesus, Paul believed, and we can also believe, That one day, we don't know when, one day, everything will be made right. And Paul said the reason that it hasn't been made right yet is because of all the sin and injustice in the world. But the God of hope doesn't give up easily. The God of hope has found a way through all of that. And it came at great, great cost in a way that would shock the world, it came in a way that if we were watching the play unfold on stage in the ancient world, we would have been so moved that we would have stood up and applauded. We would have been so moved that we would have stood up and we would have wept. Paul writes, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Amen. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Why does hope not disappoint? Not because things are always going to turn out the way that I want them to. Not because I've conquered my emotions through all sufficient reason. Hope doesn't disappoint because Jesus chose to give his life and suffer and die on a cross. And he chose to do that for people who were still sinners. He chose to do that for me. He chose to do that for you. And he chose to do it Not because any of us had done anything to deserve it. Not because we were good enough. No, far from it. He chose to do it while we were still sinners. And if we ever really understood the power in that, if the world ever really understood the power in that, we would stand up and cheer like we've never cheered for anything before. That's the good news. That's why hope doesn't disappoint. Jesus died not for virtuous people and not just for worthy people, but Jesus died for sinful, messed up people like you and like me. The answer to human suffering is not isolated, self-sufficient, all-powerful reason. No, the answer to human suffering is love. Love that groans out of the heart of God for broken men and women. And that's why we groan too. We groan for broken humanity. We groan for the completely broken world. Writers in the ancient world, and even today, they use uh, this device that's sometimes called the pathetic fallacy. It's the idea of attributing emotions to nature, to creation. 
It, it's portraying nature as if nature itself can empathize with human emotion and feeling and suffering. It's like in the Disney movie Bambi. Now, I don't want to spoil the movie for you. <laughs> but something really sad happens to Bambi's mother. And when this very sad thing happens, it starts to rain. As though the earth itself is crying. And Paul says that there's a reason why this idea, this, this idea of nature weeping, this pathetic fallacy, why it keeps popping up in literature across the centuries, and it's rooted in reality. Look at what he writes. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from this sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We too are the losers. We too are the failures and the rejects. And so we groan. We groan within ourselves. But that's okay. Because it's not just creation that groans. And it's not just us who groan. But the Spirit of God himself groans and intercedes for us with groans that the words cannot express. Paul continues, And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example... We don't know what, what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father, who knows all hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Are you kidding me? A groaning God? A God who chooses to share in suffering and weakness and pain and groaning for a sinful, unworthy person like me? Yeah, exactly that. And it's not just that. What we glory in is precisely God's willingness to suffer. Now remember, for the ancients, it was the wise man who would separate himself from the unworthy and separate himself to avoid groaning. Paul writes... Two more hardship lists in the 8th chapter of Romans, but he puts them to unprecedented use. Remember, a hardship list was supposed to encourage you to not hope because of these potential hardships. This had never been done before, the way he uses it. Paul doesn't glory in how hardships display our virtues like the Stoics would have. He, he doesn't glory in how hardships grow our virtues like ancient philosophers would have. He doesn't talk about our virtues here at all. Here's what he says. He says, Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God. God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What does Paul glory in? What do we glory in? We glory in our friend, Jesus. We are headed for something infinitely better than just self-protection from suffering. No matter how hard your hardship is. Jesus is with you. Did you hear that? Listen. No matter how hard 
your hardship is, Jesus is with you. No matter how hard your hardship is, Jesus is with you. No matter how hard your hardship is, Jesus is with you. Some of you need to be reminded of that today. Some of you need to hear that today for the first time. No matter how hard your hardship is, Jesus is with you. The attainment of an emotionally manageable and pleasant life is not the reason that we walk on this groaning planet. Remember, the ancients said that a conqueror was a person who had maintained his tranquility in the face of an impersonal world that would always be broken. That was the conqueror. It was like, I've learned to not let the world get to me. But Paul says, no, in all these things, these really difficult things, we are more than conquerors. He said, we are not conquerors. We are more than conquerors. How are we more than conquerors? Not through ourselves, not through you or me, not through our own power, not because we live triumphant and pain-free lives, and certainly not because we've figured it all out. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. This is the magnificent view of human history that simply overwhelmed the ancient world. This is the magnificent view of human history that has captivated the human heart ever since. And this view of history has produced hope that leads people to to suffer and die for a cause like no other. The cause of Jesus Christ. This is hope. Not just for you, not just for the world, and not just for creation. Our hope is that things will not always be the way they are now. A day is coming, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow. We don't know when. But a day is coming when death and sin and pain and guilt will be completely conquered. And groaning will finally be over. So keep hope alive. Keep it alive precisely in your pain, in your suffering, in your groaning. Keep hope alive in your marriage. Keep hope alive in your family. Keep hope alive in your singleness. Keep hope alive in your job. Keep hope alive in your joblessness. Keep hope alive in your home. Keep hope alive in your homelessness. Keep hope alive in your strength and in your weakness. Keep hope alive in your faith and keep hope alive in your doubt. Because listen, hope has a name. His name is Jesus. In other words, hold on to your friend Jesus because nothing can separate you from him. When you pray, groan. When you can't pray, groan. And when you can't groan, get somebody to groan with you. Wait in hope. Work in hope. Play in hope. Pray in hope. Live in hope. Speak in hope. Go to bed tonight and sleep in hope. As we do this, our hope grows. 
Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Just take this time right now. Quiet your heart, quiet your mind. I find it really helpful when I pray to, to, in order to really focus my attention singularly on God, to close my eyes, maybe bow your head. You don't have to do that. It, It can just be very helpful when you're trying to get your focus singularly on God and spend some time right now talking to him. Maybe there's an area of your life where you've lost hope, where hope has been stolen from you. Cry out to God to restore your hope. And if you don't know what to say, groan. And if you don't even have the ability to groan, just call out to the Holy Spirit to intercede for you with groans that are beyond human words. The Father knows what it is. Father God, I want to pray for everyone gathered here today in person and online, and especially for those who need a boost of hope. Holy Spirit, will you come? Will you move? Will you intercede for us? Will you groan on our behalf? And God, in the name of Jesus, will you restore hope? I know that there's some of you here today or online who you just, this is new for you, this, this idea of hope, this, this Jesus hope. Well, in a few minutes, I'm going to close the service. I'm going to dismiss the service, and we're going to have a ministry team up here, up front, in, in front of the stage, online. Our, our team's available when you click the prayer button. In fact, ministry team, could you go ahead and start to make your way down to the front just so that you're ready? So for those of you who this is new for and and you want to learn more about this Jesus hope, how to enter into this, how to to start to have this hope in your life, please come talk to one of our team members. Click on the prayer button. We would be so honored to tell you more about that hope, to pray with you, to pray for you, to groan with you and for you, and to begin to experience this hope of Jesus in your life life. And for others where you just feel like you can't ever have hope again. It's just been so bad. So many things have happened. Just too much has been lost or or taken away. You know what? Our God of hope, he doesn't give up easily. And he is not done. He wants you to have hope again. Will you come? Let us pray for you. Let us pray for that hope to be restored because I am absolutely confident, even optimistic, and truly hopeful that God can and will restore your hope. If you're, um, if you're able to, can I ask you to please stand? I want to pray a blessing over all of you before we dismiss today. God, I thank you for this group of people, for this this family as we gather together online, in person. God, I thank you for your presence, Holy Spirit, that you've filled this place. I thank you for the words you have spoken to us today. God, will you let us leave again with renewed hope? And Father, for those who need to take a brave step and come forward and talk to somebody, will you give them that strength, that courage to step out in faith, to enter into a relationship of hope with you? God, I pray your blessings over all of us as we leave this place. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for being here this holiday weekend. We will see you next weekend. Bye.